Again, this week we celebrate the birthday of our nation, almost reaching 250 years old now. Uh, Still just a baby as far as uh, nations go. Uh, Our nation, not that old. Aside from ancient Israel, however, I can think of no nation that has been so blessed as the United States of America, especially in terms of the knowledge of the Word of God. Now, I would not ever say that America has ever truly been a Christian nation. For at no time have those who are Christians in truth, truly born again, ever been the majority. Only then would I say that our country is a Christian nation. But America was founded by an overwhelming majority who claimed to be Christians, who operated in a certain fear of God, and especially esteemed the Bible and churches. And we still benefit from some of that founding to this day. America has certainly had its national sin. Some of those have been dealt with harshly. But for close to two centuries as a nation, we could at least say to some extent, in God we trust. I believe that. I wear this tie because I'm thankful for that. Thankful, I'm thankful to be an American. That motto, in God we trust, we all know it's still prevalent in our society today. It's still on our coins. But today, I think we'd all probably say, for the most part, it's empty. Does America trust in God? The biblical God? Can we see that from our leaders? I would say no. We, we turned our back on God quite a while ago and proclaiming the need for separation of church and state. Now, the simple, straightforward truth is, and you know this, there is no vacuum when it comes to who you serve. Joshua didn't say, choose if you will serve. He says, choose who you will serve. And so when we decided we can't allow God into the classroom, then that meant another God took his place. And that God in America is secular humanism. As Americans, we began to worship man. We can chart our own path. We don't need God's truth infiltrating our politics. We don't need God's truth in the classrooms. We want our truth instead. And we see where that's taken us. This is what we see in our world today and in our society today are the fruits of those decisions. If you say no to God, then you are bringing in some falsehood, some other deity. Our nation's heart continues to grow darker. Of course, we see in our our own history uh, that we started pursuing the right to do as we please in our own eyes. We threw off those restrictive Christian teachings. Things like, thou shalt not kill. Instead, we decide, no, we want the right to determine when life begins so that we can kill our unwanted babies. And we have done so for decades, tens of millions now sacrificed to the gods of pleasure and fornication. That's America. We redefined marriage as a nation. We call good what God pronounced as evil. Christianity once the esteemed religion in America is now constantly derided, mocked, and distorted. Churches, which once held enormous sway on the culture and society as the overwhelming majority of Americans were churchgoers, have not only seen their impact dwindle to barely a peep, but have even been swayed to the godless society. Churches, rather than, uh, than the world being called to repent by God's people, the supposed people of God, churches have repented to the world. And now there's not much difference. No month in America anymore is more disturbing than our month-long national celebration of what the Bible calls abomination, strange, fe- strange flesh, and vile affections. Pride Month. We're just about to say goodbye to it, thankfully. But that which we are celebrating and proud of is a sin which stands alone as the one sin that called for God in his just judgment to send fire from heaven and destroy. A name that lives in infamy, Sodom. A sin which bears its name, Sodomy, which our society calls gay. We march in pride of it. I was just in Washington, D.C. a couple weeks ago. The flag's everywhere. The U.S. flag and right beside it are pride in our abominations. It's disgusting. 
You know, this stuff, when we ponder it, and where our nation's now at, it angers, it saddens, and it disturbs, especially when I think of my children. And what will this nation be like 10 years from now? Because all of it is rapidly accelerating. Our slide into the abyss just grows further and further, deeper and darker. And I find myself sometimes asking, again, the question, where did it all go wrong? What, what is the big issue in America? And I think the big issue is America's churches. I think what happened in America was what happened in the church house. When Elijah was carried up to heaven by a whirlwind, that flaming chariot of fire, Elisha cried out this. He said, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. Why did Elisha cry that? What was that all about? What was he declaring? The power, the strength, the might of Israel did not reside in the palace. And who was sitting on the throne there? The power did not reside in the army. It wasn't in the nation's population or its natural resources. But the power of the nation of Israel was in the man of God. It was Elijah, the one on whom the Spirit of the Lord rested. And so too, if America has been great and there have been times of greatness, it's been because not of our armies, though we have had some incredible warriors. It's not been because of its leaders, though we have had some great men in those positions. It's not been its resources or America's population, though God has indeed shed his grace on us there. But it's been its churches. And when God's people have been on fire, full of the Spirit, single-minded, seeking the glory of God, doing his will, when they've been holy, set apart from the world, America's been transformed. We've seen it throughout our history. The revivals that swept and left in their way closed down saloons in a transformed city. Even in places like Chicago. Can you imagine today Chicago closing down their saloons and getting right with God? But it happened because churches were on fire. Alas, our churches today walk into most denominations and you'll find the most abominable acts. Churches today host drag queen story hour. Churches pride themselves on tolerance for perversion. Here's just some headlines from the last week in churches in our country. A Lutheran church in Houston preached that God sending Jesus to earth was God's way of coming out and speaking his truth. Likening the incarnation of Jesus Christ to the perversion of somebody coming out of the closet. The Episcopal Church in America changed the design and colors of their logo to a pride shield for the month of June. Popular contemporary Christian group Jars of Clay attended a pride parade to show their support. Of course, the United Methodists just went through a very public split with the majority of American churches remaining in and this year voting to ordain LGBTQ pastors. These are our churches. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 says the church is the pillar and ground of truth in society. And the church is practicing these things. And that's just scratching the surface of the issues. Prominent preachers continue to fall and bring open shame on the name of Christ. Recent examples on a national level include popular preacher Tony Evans and recently Robert Morris. It was disclosed that he had molested a 10-year-old girl while serving as pastor and did so for years, and the church hid it. We could multiply such examples, including the Falwells at Liberty University, Carl Lentz of Hillsong, New York, Bill Gothard. We see the sins of the church on full display. And not just that, who hasn't come across a skeptic who declares that churches and pastors are only after money? You can hardly blame them for such a statement. 
When you see men like Kenneth Copeland, Pat Robertson, Benny Hinn, Joel Osteen, all who had net worths between 40 and $340 million. Turning the work of the ministry into a scheme to pad their own pockets. Further, we know this. Many churches have turned their worship into carnal indulgence, and unashamedly so. Some churches have literally had a circus in their auditorium as worship. A circus. Not just say, oh, that felt like a circus. No, they had a circus in their church to worship God. Many seem to desire to give the attendees the feel of a Taylor Swift concert. Bring in the deafening music, the fog machines, the darkened atmospheres. We look around at our churches today and the Christians that inhabit them. And so many could be classified as the Laodiceans, focused on materialism. So many, like the church of Sardis, a name that they're alive, but they're dead. So many, like Ephesus, ones who hold the orthodox, the orthodox doctrine, but they've left their first love. Consequently, the overwhelming majority of churches across this land have either had Ichabod etched on them or soon will. In 1 Samuel chapter number 4, where we're at today, we see a congregation, an entire nation, that were the people of God in that day. And by the end of the chapter, in chapter number 4, where that nation stood, where that congregation of people stood was at a place of ruin and disaster. And their epitaph that was written across them on that occasion, we read in verses 21 and 22, Ichabod, the glory's departed. It's over. Now, when I think of the United States of America, we can see that on the horizon if it's not already been written. And if we're going to make a difference, and if we're going to be part of the solution and not the problem, then we collectively and individually must understand the cause that brought on the glory departing and also the correction to it. How can we keep this from happening to me, to us? Well, in this passage we're going to see this morning, there's going to be four causes And I believe each of them bring with us the other side, which is the correction that will help us to avoid Ichabod. Let's pause for prayer and ask the Lord to speak in this passage. Father, I come to you today just asking a blessing. Fill me with your spirit, I pray. Lord, teach us from this passage what happened in Israel. And Lord, may you apply it to our lives. May we we see the warnings. May we rightly search our own hearts. And Father, may we follow after you and not fall into sin. And Lord, find ourselves one place declaring the glory has departed. Help us, Lord, in this, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The first thing I'd have you to note in 1 Samuel chapter number 4 is that there was an awful absence rather than the abiding presence of God in the land. And we see the reaction of verses 20 to 22. It's a reaction to what took place in this chapter. And I just want to summarize. I don't have time to read through the whole chapter. But the nation of Israel was facing their longtime nemesis. And, and really, it was just the beginning of their interactions and their battles with the Philistines. The Philistines were their chief enemy during the, uh, the, uh, the work of Samuel. And while Samuel was judge, they were the primary enemy and adversary. While Saul was king, they were that primary adversary, even while David was king. We remember the story of David and Goliath. Goliath, the champion of the Philistines. And in this chapter, Israel goes goes out to fight the Philistines, and Israel is defeated. Didn't have to be, but they were. They were defeated. And when they got back together, they said, why were we defeated? How can we change this? We need to subdue the Philistines. And, and so they decided what they would do is they would bring the Ark of the Covenant with them. And they said, if we had the Ark of the Covenant in battle, we can't be beat. In fact, in these verses, you'll see, they'll say, the Ark of the Covenant will save us. It'll deliver us. 
So they went out with the Ark of the Covenant and two corrupt priests by the name of Hophni and, and Phinehas, the sons of Eli, and those two men with the Ark of the Covenant lead them to battle. And it was probably the worst day in Israel's history because not only was the army defeated, not only were their leaders, Hophni and Phinehas, killed, but the Philistines took possession of the Ark of the Covenant. When word came back of what had happened in the battle, the, the actual high priest, Eli, who was in his 90s, uh, he got the news and, and he was sitting there worried. He knew what was going to happen. And when he got the news, he fell over backwards and he died, breaking his neck in the fall. And as we find in this passage, Phineas' wife, she who was pregnant, went into labor with, at the news and made this declaration as she gave birth to her son. She, in fact, died giving birth. And she looked at her son and she plagued him with a name, Ichabod. The glories departed. It's all over. The nation sunk. When we look at this passage, we notice the reaction I don't know how deep this woman's thoughts were about this, whether she was speaking of the glory of the nation, but we do know the Lord manifested his presence to the nation by what we call the Shekinah glory. And the Shekinah glory abode in the tabernacle over the Ark of the Covenant. It could be that because the Ark was lost, that the Shekinah glory wasn't present. I don't know. Maybe that's what she anticipated it happened because the Ark was gone. But the glory is departed. That's her declaration. Now, here's the reality, and here's what I want to get in this point. The reality is the Lord was not with them, and he wasn't with them even before they went out to battle. He wasn't with them in that battle, and that's why they lost. The glory had departed before they ever went and fought the Philistines. They just didn't know it. You see, if God's not with us, it spells certain defeat. It's possible for the people of God to embark in a battle, assuming God will grant the victory, to actually fight God's enemies and still lose. If God's not with us, we can't do it. Like these people in 1 Samuel, like the Israelites in Joshua's day, the questions begin, why? Why, why has failure come rather than the sweet victory of God? And, and we see the reason these people were far from God. They hadn't been walking with God. We'll see that in just a moment. They assumed God was with them, but in reality, God was far from them. They were so far from God, they didn't even realize his absence. Is that possible? You know, the Bible says that about Samson. Here's what it says of Samson in the book of Judges. It says that when Samson rose up to fight, it says he knew not that the Lord was departed from him. Your heart can get so self-deceived that you don't even know God's not with you. You can go out expecting God to bless, and God is far from you. We see it with these people. The people of God, the nation of Israel. It's that way for so many today, churches and individuals. Well, why? Why was it the Lord had departed from them? Well, let's look at four things. I want to see here today four causes and four corrections. Four causes in this passage. And the first one is this. Go back in chapter 4 and notice verse number 4. It says, So the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring from thence the ark of the covenant of the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth between the cherubims and the two sons of Eli. Hophni and Phinehas were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. The first thing I want you to know as to why God wasn't with them was because there was settled sin rather than serious sanctification. There was settled sin rather than serious sanctification. We notice these two wicked siblings. If you go back just two chapters, the first Samuel chapter two, we read a little bit about these guys. In verse 12, it says, Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. That's the description of Hophni and Phinehas. And the priest's custom with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest servant came while the flesh was in seething or boiling with the flesh shook of three teeth in his hand. He struck it into the pan or kettle or, 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 kettle or cauldron or pot. And all that that flesh hook, all that he was able to grab out, 
went to him to eat. And so they did in Shiloh unto all the Israelites that came thither. And also before they burnt the fat, the priest's servant came and said to the man that sacrificed, Give flesh to roast for the priest, for he'll not have sodden flesh of thee, but raw. So what happened here was they went in, and when people were bringing sacrifices, they were taking meat that didn't belong to them. Things that would be offered to God, things that would be enjoyed by the family themselves, they were corrupting the sacrifice just to feed their flesh, just to gratify their stomach. These boys, overgrown boys, even as men, had no control over their flesh. They didn't know God. They didn't fear God. They didn't care. They were going to do what they wanted to do. In verse number 22, their wicked behavior had invaded the house of God. The Bible tells in verse 22, Now Eli was very old. He heard all that his sons did unto all Israel, how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. They completely corrupted the house of God. They brought the sin into the house of God. And all Israel knew it. Now, God had told Israel in Leviticus chapter 11 and verse 44, I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy, for I am holy. But instead, in the nation, there was open sin. And the whole congregation of Israel knew about it, including the high priest Eli. And they didn't deal with the sin. They let it remain. Now, there's warnings in Scripture. We see the defeat that came for the children of Israel on this occasion because of the sin that was present with them. We see it in the story of Joshua as Israel went out to fight Ai, and they lost because there was sin in the camp. When sin comes, so comes separation. How can God abide with us when we allow sin in our lives? 1 John 1 says, if we say that we have fellowship with Him, if we claim God's with me and I'm walking with God, and we walk in darkness. If we're walking in sin, if our heart's not right with God, it says we lie and we do not the truth. It's either sin or it's the Savior. It can't be both. And if you choose your sin, you've said no to God. His power, His fellowship, His presence on your life. And any church, any congregation that allows sin into their midst, and says, no, like the church in 1 Corinthians, hey, we're open-minded. We're tolerant. We're not going to judge. There was a sign of a church in town. We don't judge anybody. Jesus didn't either. Have you read the Bible? Jesus is the righteous judge. What are you talking about? We've got to have righteous judgment, and we cannot allow sin to remain. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Instead, we see the warning when that separation comes because sin remains, the glory departs. The way of success is to deal with sin. When the first church was endangered by the sin of hypocrisy, God dealt with it swiftly and thoroughly as he struck Ananias and Sapphira dead. You're not going to bring that sin into the congregation. God uses a holy people. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 21. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use. You want to be used by God, then you've got to be sanctified. The thought is holy, set apart from sin, set apart unto God. You know, I use the illustration often. We're like a toothbrush. When it comes to my toothbrush, I don't share it with anybody. My kids get a hold of my toothbrush. I'm not using it again. It goes in the trash. I don't even share my toothbrush with my wife. Maybe some of you do. I don't want to know your deepest, darkest secrets on that. <laughs> you see, that toothbrush is mine. It's intended for my mouth alone. And if it goes to someone else, it's defiled. If I'm ever putting that thing in my mouth, it's going to be thoroughly purged first by like being boiled to death. You know what I'm talking about, right? It's mine. And so is holiness. You're God's. 
You're not to allow yourself, your body, to be used by sin, to be defiled. God's not going to use the individual. God's not going to use the church that is not sanctified. He says in 1 Timothy, in 2 Timothy 2 again, if a man purges himself, then he'll be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use. I don't know about you, but I hope we'll be used by God. We've got to be serious about holiness. There's a book that was written, The Pursuit of Holiness. How many people today in this country pursue holiness? Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart. But how many really claim and, and think of that as a, as a wonderful possession to be pure in heart? So many today want what the world has. And as a result, we lose the blessing that God has. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You want to see God doing something in your life? You want to see God doing something in, in America in 2024? Blessed are the pure in heart. We've got to deal with sin. Private sin, public sin. Be pure. I know I don't want to be part of the problem in America. I want to be part of the solution. I want our church to be used by God. We've got to deal with sin where it's never going to happen. I want you to see in this passage another cause and also its correction. Notice the second cause, and that's this. There was form rather than fellowship. Again, look back in the scenario of 1 Samuel chapter number 4. The scenario. They say, hey, we've lost the battle. Bring the Ark of the Covenant, it says in verse number 3. It says in the middle of the verse, Wherefore, why hath the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? Why did this happen? Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, that when it cometh among us, it may save us. Could the ark save them? That's what they're saying. They had turned the ark into something in their minds similar to a statue, to an idol. The ark will save us. But salvation's of the Lord, He's the Savior. The ark was where he had promised to meet with them and give them access to him when they brought the blood of the spotless lamb. The ark was the symbol. The Lord was the reality. They had turned the symbol into the Savior. And oh, what a tendency of the human heart is revealed in this verse. They substituted trust in the symbol for trusting the Lord. They imagined that form and that furniture could do what only fellowship and a right relationship with the living God could do. The significance is this. It's this way for many in our day. Still today, many put their faith in an empty symbol. Many put their faith in a symbol to save them. Baptism. I was baptized to wash away my sins. It's a symbol. It can't save you. Many with communion. I'm taking into me the body of the Lord. This is life. It's a symbol. Jesus himself said, as you do these things, you show the Lord's death. It's not what saves us. Jesus saves. Jesus himself, the person of Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, our Lord, our Savior, Jesus saves. And he alone. Don't exchange the person of Jesus for a symbol. But you know, it's not just the lost that do it. It's the believer. Church meeting can become quite empty. Sometimes becoming an end in itself. We show up as a matter of mere ritual rather than an act of seeking God and worshiping him. We've talked about that as we look through the book of Galatians. It's just a box that we check on our to-do list for the week. Went to church. You've made it just a form. You're going through motions rather than enjoying the fellowship that the meeting is all about. The fellowship with Christ. We can go through the motions in prayer. Bowing our head, muttering a few words, capping it off with, in Jesus' name. And at the same time, it can be meaningless. 
a formality, an empty ritual, just words. Our giving, our witnessing, our communion, our praising, on and on the list can go. Without a vibrant fellowship, without the person of Jesus, without faith and hope and active love in Him, we're just sounding brass, meaningless noise. Revelation 3, 1, again to Sardis, I know thy works. Thou hast a name that thou livest and you're dead. It's just form. Jesus said this, abide in me. It's fellowship that we need, not just form. I'm glad that you're here this morning. But coming to church isn't an end to itself. There's a reason. It's to hear from God, for him to speak to our hearts, to lead us and, and carry us on through the week and, and, and give us and grow us, uh, giving us what we need. We come here to meet with God's people and be an encouragement to them. But most of all, it's that we come in and we say, speak, Lord, for thy servant hears. I'm here to listen to you. We read our Bibles, not just to check it off the list, not just to fill up our minds, but to fellowship with God. What an what a offer to walk with God that's given to every one of his children. So often we say Christianity is not just a religion, it's a relationship. And yet so many have turned that relationship back into a religion. Just empty works. There is no power in an individual or a congregation where there's form and not fellowship. The fellowship must be behind all that we do. Notice a third reason, and that is this. There was emotionalism rather than empowerment. There was emotionalism rather than empowerment. Notice in this passage, the Bible tells us in verse number five, when the ark of the covenant of the Lord came into the camp, multitudes there, all the warriors are there, and they see the Ark of the Covenant come in. Notice the response. All Israel shouted with a great shout. You can imagine the cheering. In fact, it says, so that the earth rang again. The enemy, probably miles away, hears the shout. What is this noise about? They were excited. Even the enemy heard it. The multitude was excited. They had energy. They had confidence. They were all worked up into a frenzy together. The good vibes were flowing that day. You could just feel it. But it was all empty. It was nothing more than empty emotionalism. Being excited, being fired up, getting the good feelings, having confidence, even faith that you're going to be victorious means nothing if God, in fact, is not with you. And so in all their excitement and in all their confidence and in all their frenzy, they march off to battle and suffer the worst defeat in the nation's history. How many today think that the emotional workup they get on Sunday morning is evidence of the Lord being with them? And of the coming success in the battles of the day. The size of the crowd, the energy of the meeting, the moving music, the pep in their step as they leave. God met with us today. When in fact, in many, even most cases, it's not the spirit that's filling them. It's just empty emotionalism. Can I tell you today, don't live for a feeling. Don't turn worship into empty emotionalism. That's what so many have done and they've left the truth. I recall talking with a former worship leader several years ago. He was the drummer of a church band. He told me that he learned how to manipulate people's feelings through the music. He said people would come to him after the meeting and they would say, the spirit was really moving today. Oh man, you were so filled with the spirit. He said all the while, he wasn't even walking with God. He came to see that what was truly happening, what he learned how to do was to manipulate people's emotions through music. He said, I was fake. Everything I was doing was fake. They were excited, but it wasn't the spirit moving. And I remember on that day, he was looking now for something real. It's not just in the rock and roll churches where this happens. We can deceive ourselves without music into thinking that God's moving. That God's with us when in fact it's a false feeling. I remember a song that used to be sung at my grandparents' church. 
in the song through the chorus, it went like this. I'm so tired of being stirred. I'm so tired of being stirred about the things of the Lord. I'm so tired of being stirred about the loss that are yet to be won. I'm so tired of being stirred about this and that. He says, I'm so tired of being stirred and not being changed. More than the feeling, more than the stirring, the evidence of God's work in us is the change. If we're just wound up, but we never change, is God really at work? The evidence, the evidence of the Spirit's work in us, of the true empowerment, the Word of God is clear what that looks like. We saw that last week. When the Spirit comes, when we walk in the Spirit, what follows? Love. A love that serves others. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. These are the evidences of life and God being with us. Are we growing in the fruit? Are these things displayed in us? Are we becoming more like Christ? Is Christ seen in us uh, in, in our, in our, in our, from our spouse? Do, do they see Christ in us? Do the lost see Christ in us? Is my mission and my mindset like Christ? What's the evidence of the Spirit's work? Go to the book of Acts. You know what some more evidence of it was? Boldness. Boldness to do what? To preach the gospel. We can get stirred up on Sunday and be silent as a mouse on Monday. Is the Spirit really moving us? We can get stirred up on Sunday and even forget our purpose on Monday. I'm asking today, is the Spirit at work in you? Have you quenched the Spirit? Because that's when ultimately Ichabod will come. In the church, in the individual's life, the ones who no longer are yielded to the Spirit, but rather allow the flesh to dictate their life so that settled sin comes in, they are the ones where the glory departs. Further evidence of the Spirit's work we saw in Ephesians chapter number 5 a couple weeks ago on Father's Day. I'm sorry, in Ephesians, yes, chapter number 5, speaking the truth in song. A joy in the heart. A thankful spirit. Submission. All of these things, evidences of the Spirit. Not just emotionalism. Look, don't get me wrong. It's not wrong to be excited. It's not wrong to have emotion. We need those things. But is it empty? Or is there true empowerment? Our power comes from the Holy Spirit. I want us to see one final cause and one final correction. And that is this in 1 Samuel chapter 4. There was sitting rather than standing. And what I mean by that is in the story of Eli. The Bible tells us in verse number 13, Eli, who was the high priest when all this is going on. We don't find him in verses 1 down to verse number 11 as the ark of God's taken. We don't find him at the forefront of the battle. We don't find him telling the nation what God has said. We find Eli in the passage. And Eli, it says in verse number 13, was sitting. But more than just physically sitting, he was sitting out what he should have been standing up to do. Eli sat on that seat. It tells us in verse 13 that his heart trembled. Why did Eli's heart tremble? Why was he shaking? Why? Had, they, had he gotten word yet that they lost? No. The messengers weren't back yet. But Eli knew something. Eli knew the truth. Eli had been warned by God years earlier to do something about his sons. Eli had not only been warned by God to do something about his sons and then refused, never did remove them because he favored his sons over God. Though they were corrupt and though they were wicked, he allowed them to continue in that ministry. He left them there. He didn't intervene. And so God made another prophecy that both of his sons would die in one day. Eli knew it was coming. 
And Eli, as he sat there on that seat, trembling, I think Eli was certain the day had come. I think Eli knew when they went out to battle with the Ark of the Covenant, it could be a disaster. And yet, he sat there. And he didn't do anything about it. Why remain speechless? There was so much at stake. Wouldn't men lose their lives if Eli was silent? Shouldn't he have gotten up, stood up, spoke up? Instead, he sat down and remained silent. You know, I think we all understand this. Knowledge of the truth brings responsibility. If you know the truth, then you have a responsibility to speak the truth. But Eli valued personal ease over the cause of Christ. I imagine Eli probably reasoned to himself it was too late. He couldn't stop them. But in his inaction, throughout his life, Eli became complicit in their deeds. And there's a tremendous lesson here for us. You study in history and you probably have come across this phrase. All that is necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. It's not that I have to go out and start pushing and carrying a rainbow flag to make evil come. It's that God's people sit when they ought to stand. Is that we're silent when we ought to speak. You know, we look at America today. We have been given a great open door. We have these amendments, the First Amendment, which is so rich and wonderful. The freedom of speech, the freedom of the press, the freedom of religion. And this door has been wide open to us for the duration of our lives to speak truth, to print the truth, to think the truth. And yet, how are we using this open door? How long is that door going to be open? Maybe it's going to be open for the duration of my life. I don't know. It might close within the next decade. Even now, there's rumblings of it. I know that our government put out for their employees that they're to use the preferred pronouns. Somebody comes up to you with some made-up word, and you're supposed to go along with it. Is that an attack on freedom of speech? You bet it is. Is that an attack on your freedom of religion? You bet it is. If we don't have eyes to see that that door could close, I don't know what it's going to take to wake you up. And I'm here to tell you today, while the door is open, use it. Use it. When's the last time you told somebody that Jesus came to save them? When's the last time you warned somebody about the penalty of sin? When's the last time you told Americans who have been fed a bunch of lies that God's some Santa Claus is just going to give them what they want, and you told them, no, he's a holy God. He's a righteous God. He's a just God. And he will not at all acquit the wicked. Do we speak out? Or do we sit by? What happened in America is churches that had the truth and people that knew the truth were too busy with the cares of this world to be used of God to stem the tide. Now I want to tell you something in 1 Samuel chapter 4. Well, this lady declared the glory had departed and it looked like the nation was over. God wasn't done with them yet. In fact, another leader would take Eli's place, a man that God used greatly, whose name was Samuel. And revival came. And victory 
in freedom. But it took somebody standing up and speaking truth. We know the words and the sad words later in the nation of Israel in the book of Ezekiel as it says, the Lord sought for a man among them to stand in the gap and make up the hedge. And what does he say? I found none. None. That was when the glory truly did depart and the nation ceased. I'm telling you today, there's a cause for the collapse of our society. And there's a correction. There's a correction that must be made in your life and in mine. Will there be settled sin or will there be serious sanctification? God's not going to use somebody who walks in the flesh. God's not going to use somebody who just gives in to sin. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. In your life, is there settled sin or serious sanctification? Second one, in your life, is it empty form or vibrant fellowship? Empty form or vibrant fellowship? In your life, is it simply empty emotionalism, getting stirred up, hearing the truth, yeah, we got to do it, but never changing? Or is there empowerment from the Spirit of God? In your life, have you been sitting or standing? Are you silent or speaking truth? This morning, I want us to see there is a reason that Israel collapsed. I hope you see today there's a reason our nation is collapsing. And who's responsible? And who can stop the collapse? We know only one. His name's Jehovah. And who's he going to use? Why not us? Why not us? Can we make a difference in Northport? Absolutely. Do we not have the gospel? Is it not the power of God to salvation? Do we not have the Spirit dwelling within us? Is that not God the Spirit? Is that not the power that changed the world in Paul's day? The Spirit of God? Do we not have prayer? That avenue which reaches up to the throne of the universe. Where we're invited to come boldly. What are we lacking? We're lacking the will. We're lacking the wisdom. Today, while the door is open, glorify God. Pursue sanctification and holiness. Pursue fellowship with Christ. Pursue empowerment through the Spirit. Pre pre pursue and stand and speak the truth. Let's pray. Father, I come to you today. I thank you for your word. I just pray your blessing on it. And Lord, use your word in our lives. Help us, Lord, to truly evaluate ourselves. Lord, you know our hearts. You know our needs. Lord, I pray that Ichabod would not be written across or etched across this church now or into eternity. I pray, Father, Ichabod would not be etched across a single life, that one would be disapproved, cast away, salt set aside because it lost its savor. Father, I pray that we would be a people fervent, a people serious about holiness, a, a people serious Lord, about seeking the Savior and fellowship and the Spirit's filling. Father, help us in this, I pray. May we stand and not remain silent. Help us, Lord. Bless the invitation, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen.